Greetings, fellow humans. Welcome to Brain Mail. I am Dr. Jones. We're hearing a lot in the news about fentanyl overdoses, about prescription painkiller overdoses, about the opioid epidemic. In the grand scheme of things, what we're talking about is that human beings have pain and we have traditionally for thousands of years used morphine and codeine that are raw ingredients of the poppy plant and we have taken that to treat our pain. We've evolved over time to a place where those ingredients and derivatives of those ingredients are being put into needles and that needle is being put into a vein and a drug is being injected into the vein and a short period of time later, somebody is dead. Why is this happening? That's the purpose of this episode today. So you really get a deep understanding of the parts involved here, the brain and the parts of the brain right down at the cellular level that are being involved in fatal overdoses. And when you grasp that, you have a very different perspective and the word drug overdose becomes a much bigger world than just simple two words drug overdose. So let's get into that. The brain is made of about 100 billion neurons. I have made a pretend neuron right here. This is, and you've heard of what's called gray matter. So this is a volleyball that I spray painted gray. This green wire here is a essentially a biological wire called an axon that plugs into, figuratively speaking, another brain cell and excites it or actually inhibits it. And you have this enormous network and everybody's using the term neural network now this enormous network of cells that connects one to the other. And there are dozens and dozens of different pathways in the brain. Let's just focus on addiction today and some concepts about pain a little bit. So what I've not talked about so far is this little blue deal here, which is actually a vanilla coffee creamer that I crazy glued to this vault. What is going to sit in that receptor? specifically the drug class known as opioids. Nothing else is going to sit in there. Sugar's not going to sit in there. Um, other things are not going to sit in there. It is specific for opioids. To make this perfectly clear, the drug class we're talking about are opioids and that is an opioid receptor. Now let's talk about the opioids that actually bind to this receptor. This cat toy is morphine. And morphine is the reference standard for potency for the rest of the opioids. So here's morphine. It's gonna sit in this opioid receptor. It is assigned a value of one. That's its potency. So if, if there's one take home message from here, remember for sure, morphine is assigned a value of one. Now let's go on to some other ones for comparison. This is codeine. It's gonna sit in the same opioid receptor. Its potency is actually one sixth, one sixth, <laughs> one sixth that of morphine. Let me just put one sixth down here. Codeine goes right here. Codeine, by the way, is actually in the body. If you take codeine, it is actually metabolized to morphine. And that's how the pain killing effect in the brain is going to take place. Codeine is converted to morphine. This is heroin. Heroin has twice the potency of morphine. Remember, morphine is one. So let's put heroin right there. Uh, just a quick tangent here for a uh, big picture. The poppy plant as a natural ingredient, morphine and codeine and about 35 other substances. Heroin is made from morphine. So man makes heroin from morphine, which is made by mother nature. So heroin is actually sometimes called semi-synthetic. Just some FYI there. Next up on our roster of opioids is oxycodone. Does it sit in the opiate receptor? Yes, it does. It's potency two relative to morphine. To make this perfectly clear, oxycodone, this opiate sits in this receptor, twice as potent as 
morphine. Oxycontin is exactly the same thing. This is just the marketing name made by the drug company, Purdue Pharma, that makes it. And they created this name because in the case of the drug that's sold to the public, it's got essentially what is kind of a wax coating on this so that it takes about eight hours to get dissolved as it goes through your intestines. So it's actually a marketing name that means oxycodone continuous release. Have you heard of Percocet before? Percocet contains oxycodone plus acetaminophen. It's a combination painkiller. The opioid in Percocet, however, is oxycodone. Let's spell Percocet. Percocet is a drug that has two drugs in it. One is oxycodone and the other is acetaminophen. So they call it Percocet and the set part is taken from the acetaminophen and then the Percocet part is just part of the, again, that's, this, is a, this is a marketing name, Percocet. The next opioid is called hydromorphone. Hydromorphone is the technical chemical name. There is a marketing name of this drug called Dilaudid. Hydromorphone and Dilaudid are exactly the same thing. This is just the marketing name. That is the basic chemical name. This is probably the most commonly abused opiate by the patients that I see in my clinic. And what's common to use is called like a red rocket, which is often crushed, dissolved in water, put into a syringe and injected. Very common. Its potency, five times that of morphine. This is fentanyl. This is what's causing lots of problems currently. Fentanyl sits in the same opioid receptor as all this. Remember, this is morphine. It's got a potency of one. What is the potency of fentanyl? It's 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine. Fentanyl was originally used in the operating room to treat the pain in uh, patients undergoing surgery. Lots and lots of drugs are given to patients who are getting surgery, what's called a general anesthetic. Fentanyl is one of them that is sometimes given as a top up and it's actually given in a liquid form. And this is a patient who's unconscious, but the anesthetist can tell by the change in heart rate sometimes of a patient, even though they're unconscious, that they may need some more uh, top up. And it's very short lasting, which is why it's really, really useful in the operating room because it lasts a very short time. You just need a short top up. What happened next was that this same drug, fentanyl, a drug company came along and said, hey, this is a really good painkiller. Can we convert this short term drug, even though, it's, uh, even though it lasts a very short time, it only lasts about four hours, let's put it into a patch. I don't have a fentanyl patch, here's a Band-Aid. So let's impregnate this patch with a whole bunch of fentanyl. And then I take the patch and I put it on my arm and I wear this patch of fentanyl for 48 hours, sometimes 72 hours. Then I take it off, ideally, you take it off, you give it to the pharmacist so they know that you've used it and you get another one. How do we abuse this? You take this fentanyl patch, you pretend you're gonna use it, you extract the fentanyl from it, if you're creative, and human beings are very creative, you take that and you put it in a needle. What has happened just now? This is supposed to take 48 hours to go through your skin and, and uh, treat your pain. Maybe it's for back pain because it's commonly, these, these patches are used for back pain. You took all the drug here, you put it in this syringe, you injected it into your arm, and within 30 seconds it gets to your brain. This means you got a whack of drug instead of in 48 hours, and I think 48 hours is 1440 minutes in a day. That's instead of in 2880 minutes, this being absorbed into the body, it's taking place in 30 seconds. Can you overdose and die from that? You totally can overdose and die from that. So that's one way to die from fentanyl. You just put it in this syringe and stick it in your arm and you defeat all this work that was done to make this into a very good painkiller. So there could be a lot of complaint and you, you hear interesting arguments. You know, sometimes family members will come into the clinic and they'll say, why did they invent these painkillers? Look at this big problem we're having. Human beings are always making stuff. We make all kinds of stuff. One of them is better painkillers. On the flip side, which is the same problem we have for every single technology we have is, what are we, how are we going to abuse this technology? We can say the same of nuclear weapons. Anyways, fentanyl, powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. This is carfentanyl. Does it sit in the same opioid receptor? Absolutely, it sits right here. It is 10, 
thousand times more powerful than morphine. It's used by vets for treating elephants. This would probably be an, an elephant in a zoo. And if you read the description of carfentanil safe use by vets for elephants, they actually state that you have to be careful that you don't give the dose for an African elephant to an Indian elephant because it's smaller, because the dose of carfentanil for an African elephant can kill a Indian elephant. This happens to be like a mastodon, but let's just pretend that's an elephant who just lost his tusk. <laughs> Point being, people are actually getting carfentanil, whereas it's used for elephants. Is it going to kill you? Yes, because it can kill an elephant, it can definitely kill a person. So I hope that illustrates the point that if you're not an elephant, you should not be using carfentanil. Now, in case I sound like I'm making fun of people, because I'm not, no one goes out and says, I'm gonna get myself some carfentanil and die. There's been an evolution over time. So what we saw initially, and when I'm just talking about fentanyl here, when about five years ago, most of the patients I saw that were abusing fentanyl, they would take that fentanyl off the patch and they were getting a known amount of fentanyl. Sometime later, fentanyl is now just being made in underground like laboratories and most of this comes from overseas and a powder is given. And it's not done with rigorous standards, so it's not really clear what's in this mixture. How much of it is fentanyl? Is there some carfentanil in there sometimes? Yes, are there analogs of fentanyl that are somewhere between this strength and this strength, yeah, there's other analogs of fentanyl that can be like 300 or 6,000 times more powerful than morphine. And you're getting this like potpourri of fentanyl and its cousins that are incredibly lethal because they have incredible potency here. So that's the grand scheme of the opioids that bind to this receptor. There are many, many, many other opioids. I'm just giving you a focused look at some of the ones. These are, these are basically the most popular ones that are used. And carfentanil, of course, is not used for humans. It's used on elephants. Let's focus on something really important now, which is where do morphine and fentanyl, if it were a patch, where do they go to work in the brain? First of all, morphine, at taken at just the standard doses you're supposed to take it at, interrupts pain pathways going into the brain. And in fact, if we were to turn this model around, in yellow is the spinal cord. Sensory information that's carrying pain goes up the spinal cord and into the brain. Morphine acts right here. There are brain cells that are in the spinal cord. This is why we use the term neuron because a brain cell the actual technical word is neuron. So we find neurons in the brain and we find them in the spinal cord. The spinal cord is just an extension of the brain. It's like a two foot long whip. So morphine is going to interrupt pain pathways in the spinal cord and now you don't feel pain as much. It does also interfere with the transmission of pain pathways in the brain. Now let's move on to something different. Let's say there's a situation now where morphine or fentanyl is being abused. Let's take a brain, split it in half. If morphine is involved in addiction, there is a neuron right here, and this structure here is called the brain stem. It does a lot of stuff. There are pathways, and remember, the axon is starting at point A and it ends up at point B, and these are called pathways, or sometimes they're called uh, projections. So there is a neuron sitting right here, and it's going to have a axon that projects all the way to this area. This is the frontal lobe of the brain. And in this area is where addiction tends to occur. And what's gonna get released from the end of this particular axon at this nerve terminal in this portion of the brain, dopamine. So you see these surges in dopamine in response to addiction. So this pathway is starting here and ending here. That's the addiction. What about an overdose situation where you actually die in a opiate overdose, which could be morphine, it could be fentanyl, it could be heroin, it could be hydromorphone. All these opiates can bind to this receptor and cause problems. Now we're talking about an area lower down in the brainstem, and this portion of the brainstem, just for technical details, is called the medulla, and this area controls breathing. If you shut down this area enough, either completely or just enough, you will die. That's how you die from an opiate overdose. Let's get into some details of breathing to sink this point home. Okay. Awesome. 
These magnets, they just confuse me. There are no magnets in the brain, but there are magnets in this model. <laughs> oh Lord, every time this happens to me. Its potency is actually one sixth, one sixth, <laughs> one sixth that of, that's very hard to say, one sixth that of morphine. That I liked. <laughs>